Well, good morning. Welcome to Time Change Sunday. And uh, I'm always intrigued as, as the years go on, how many people, how many people still wind a clock? Anybody wind a clock? It's okay to say yes, there's one over there. Yeah, there's one over here. You wind a clock. Does anybody, how many people don't know what, even what that means to wind a clock? You wind a clock? Yeah. Okay, how many people over under, I think my, my over under is five. How many people have five or more clocks that they have to change time on in their home? So that's microwave, stove, coffee maker, right? So anybody under five? So I had three. Yeah, three's under five. So, so over five. Okay, anybody over seven? Over seven? Nobody else is over seven. I wish I had a prize. I wish I had a prize. <laughs> that is great. Hey, uh, welcome. It's un unbelievable that this is the first uh, weekend of November. It's incredibly beautiful out, and we uh, will we'll take advantage of that as long as we can. And, uh, and what, one of the ways that we can do that is next Saturday morning, we have our fall cleanup that is uh, scheduled to, be, uh, to happen here outside. So raking of our leaves and things like that uh, will happen at uh, 9 o'clock next Saturday, right? The fall cleanup. And uh, you can see, you want to call Art and uh, talk to him, let him know. But uh, we would love it. The more people that we have to do that, the faster it goes. And the weather forecast looks really good. Uh, and so we um, appreciate that. If you want to come, that'd be great. There's always good cookies and uh, coffee and, and uh, good conversation. So just a way that we can help get things cleaned up. Also, uh, look after our neighbors because we have a lot of trees. And uh, if we leave them too long, well, actually, you can look across the street on Talford Street and see the two neighbors that don't own trees, how many leaves that they have on their, their yard. So we will be, every year I try to buy them something to just uh, a little dinner out because... They do a lot of extra work because our leaves are there. Um, so uh, thankful for that opportunity. And then uh, as we talk about uh, opportunities to serve, we do have a couple of opportunities. Uh, one in Kid Jam. We're still looking for a, a somebody who's willing to teach once a month uh, at Kid Jam. So, and the, the preparation's kind of all there for you. And so it's, it's once a month commitment. If you'd be willing to do that, then you can, you can contact me. And then also with our kitchen being 98% ready to go, um, then uh, we're, we're looking, hoping that somebody would be willing to just to look after things in there to maintain it a little bit. And so that's about an hour uh, a week just to check to make sure supplies are there, things are clean and in order and stuff like that. That would be wonderful if somebody would be willing to, uh, to uh, consider that as well. Um, and speaking of uh, things that are happening as we, as we move further into the fall, Upward Basketball. Uh, we're starting to get ready for Upward Basketball. I invite Teresa to come up uh, because in November, while the league doesn't start till January, there's a lot of preparation that needs to be done uh, starting in November. So let's uh, hear about some of that, right?
All right, well, good morning from over here at the piano. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, Psalm 24 for us this morning. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, but he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord. And vindication from God the Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek Him. Who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, the ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty of battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, the ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this? Who is He, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. So this morning, would you stand? We're going to sing to this almighty King of glory.
Maybe just pause for a moment, and as we think about what we've just sung, who is Jesus to you? Mm -hmm. 
And how often do you reflect that back to him? Can I just encourage you to do that? Where has Jesus appeared on your journey to help you in the midst of something difficult? To be a, stabling, a stabilizing presence in the midst of uncertainty. These are the things that, that Jesus promises. His promise is that he would be, God said, he, his name would be Emmanuel, God with us. How has God sent Jesus to your life? Would you just take a moment and reflect on that? Maybe it's something from this week. Maybe it's something that goes back a little further. Maybe you're in the midst of something now and you just desire to see Jesus appear in that. It's a privilege for us to gather, right? In John, in John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray for all who will believe in, my me in, the message, in their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and I are one, you, you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that we that we may be brought, they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. So Father, as we, uh, as we recognize your prayer for us, through these words spoken so long ago, we are the benefactors, we are the recipients, and our desire is to continue until you return, Father, to, that the world may know. That Jesus is Messiah. He's our Savior. He's our Redeemer. And he is present with us in the midst of those things we go through. God, we give you our heartfelt gratitude, those things that we can't even sometimes utter. And we ask, God, that you would continue to strengthen us to honor you with all that we are. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I'm going to invite you to sing this chorus one more time before we... people said amen. amen you may be seated hey if you uh you know just the idea of coming together in unity in the under the name of jesus is is strength giving right it's a, one of the freedoms that we enjoy and uh, we are privileged to be able to do that every sunday morning here and one of the things that we've been working together across our city among uh, our churches is strengthening our unity as a body of Christ. And so let me encourage you tonight at 6.30 uh, to come to a, uh, an all-church service at Temple Baptist uh, at 6.30 tonight. And uh, we would love for you to, to be there. If you're coming, one of the things that we want to do is to be able to bless our community. So we're asking that you would bring non-perishable food items there. If you come a little bit early, like at 6 o'clock, then you'll also get to interact. We'll have booths set up in the, 
in the foyer of Temple Baptist of all the different of many of the different uh, ministries that are that are happening in in our city that are addressing needs in our city. So you'll be able to interact with them, perhaps find out a little bit more something that you can be praying for for them, or perhaps it's a way that you can be involved in in something that God is doing uh, through one of these other ministries. So I encourage you to do that. So the doors open at six. The, the, uh, the service starts at 6.30. It's a fabulous time of connecting together, assembling together in the name of Jesus, and uh, I encourage you to be there tonight. Um, and so with that, we are going to have our Kid Jam uh, teachers. Uh, Teresa is teaching uh, Kid Jam this morning, and so uh, if you want to make your way out, teachers and leaders, um, and then uh, in behind them, we'll have uh, our age two up to grade six. If you want to make your way out and down, that would be wonderful uh, to be able to do that. Thank you for that. Hey, you know, one of the, uh, one of the joys that we have uh, over the course of a year is, uh, as I talk about these different ministries that are involved in our city, we actually... Um, try to do our best as a as a governing board. Our, one of our endeavors has been, how do we highlight what is going on and allow us to partner with some of what's going on that's essential to uh, addressing needs in our community. And so our every, most months we have a, a focus. This month our focus is on is with the the Greater Glass Company. Now the Greater Glass Company. It sounds like a little bit of a strange name, and some of you are familiar with this, and others of you, this is brand new to you. Uh, the Greater Glass Company. Uh, let me get my sheet of paper here. The Greater Glass Company provides a necessary local response to the prevalence of human sex trafficking. Therefore, we want people to understand their created purpose. Advocate. We want to advocate for the vulnerable. We want to amplify the voice of survivors and advance the good work already being done through education here in our community. That's our obje those are our, our objectives of the Greater Glass Company. Some of you will know that the, uh, the initiative of this organization started here during the pandemic. Uh, one of the things that our, our governing board took that time over is to think about, pray about what areas in our community could we address that perhaps other churches weren't necessarily, wasn't on their radar to address. What could be our unique kingdom contribution? And this, because we've been involved in these, in these, uh, in these conversations with the organizations that, that address this in our city over a long number of years, this became uh, a, that kind of rose to the top. But it became such a big thing. How, we, how do we do it? Well, we can't do it on our own. That's why it's not a specifically an SEMC thing. We actually have undertaken to start an or, a separate organization called the Greater Glass Company. And, uh, and so that organization officially birthed in November of 2022. We took all of 2023 really just to pray and discern about uh, and and get prepared, to continuing to develop curriculum, um, and uh, and just with the idea of where do we go to next? How do we how do we do this? And our feeling really was, it feels like God's pulling us forward, and we're holding it back. And we really we kind of really uh, kind of felt that way. And then last November was our first real official uh, uh, event. Letting, letting people know that here we are, this is what we, are, we desire to do. And can I tell you that during 2024, it has been just a progressive, the momentum of this thing is, has just continued to, to generate uh, attention. And we've had opportunity to do presentations uh, in a wide variety of spaces. And uh, we're so thankful for that. Uh, because every time we speak, every time we get the opportunity to present, our desire is that more young people are protected from their vulnerability. We want to address the, the front end so that we don't have to address the need for the, for the other side, the, the survivor's side, lessons over the course of time. And some would say it's an impossible, it's a possible task, it's an impossible dream, and the answer would be yes. But, 
God is a God of the impossible. And over the course of this year, he's already showing uh, that uh, there is an appetite, uh, a need to help young people especially understand their created value so they are less vulnerable in these, uh, in these circumstances. I could talk about this for a long, long time. I'm not today. We do have an event that's coming up on November 20th. I'll talk about that next week. Uh, you'll, you, if you receive our e-bulletin, you'll, you'll see it in there. And uh, it's a concert, and uh, it's, it's already, we're already, anyway, I could, again. Any contribution that you make to the SEMC, to our benevolence fund during the month of November, will be given to the Greater Glass Company. And it will be used for those purposes for which I stated. And we give thanks to God for what he is doing in it. And thank you for your support of it. I'm going to invite the music team to come and, and uh, lead us in, uh, in one more song as we uh, consider um, what it means to have a flourishing life. Uh, I think this song, which is inspired by John 15, um, Abide, uh, allows us to understand that a little bit more. And let me also remind you that at the end of the service, we'll be observing communion. And so if you haven't yet uh, picked up um, your uh, little container with uh, uh, a wafer and some juice, then you can do so in the foyer or there's a basket over here and just hang on to it till the end of the service, all right? All right, all right would you stand and sing with us one more time?
And let's uh, just thank Aaron for leading us this morning with uh, Dave and Sandra Archer. There's Brittany Nelson, and over there is uh, Nathan John. So appreciate them leading us this morning. If you have a uh, Bible or a Bible app, um, do you mind just pulling that out and you can turn it to uh, open it to uh, Galatians chapter five? Galatians chapter five. I'll be reading the whole chapter in just a few minutes. And Father, as we uh, as we consider what we have sung, we considered the places you've brought us through in the course of this week and the circumstances that we find ourselves in uh, in these moments. As we consider the circumstances of our community, the need, uh, the needs, the endless need, it seems, in our community. The disruption in the world and uh, the instability that seems to surround us on, on all sides. Would the life of Christ be made known to us and through us? And as we gather to learn from your living word, Father, would you also strengthen and empower those who gather around uh, all across the world to listen in to your voice that the presence of Christ, the truth of his salvation, would go out to men and women and boys and girls. Use this time for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you know, um, for, some, for some of us, some of you, I shouldn't say us, for some of us, fall season is a transplanting time, right? Transplanting, I'm talking about plants, is the process of moving one pl from a plant from one location to the other. Some of you understand this. People do this, I'm told, for the purpose of enhancing the beauty of their gardens. They want a garden that's flourishing. And so, however, whatever that looks like, you have to unearth and replant correctly, because if you don't, then it can do more harm than good. And without careful attention, root failure, which affects leaf health and growth, is a major concern. Some of you know this, and you know that I don't. This doesn't mean that it shouldn't happen, though. In fact, some plants need to be moved. Some plants need to be pruned and divided in order for it to flourish over the long term. What it does mean then is that care and attention need to be paid over a period of time in order for that root system to be fed by the essential nutrients that they need in order to flourish. Hear this. You were created for a flourishing life. You were created for a flourishing life. However, many of us don't experience that fulfillment of flourishing because we don't pay attention to what is feeding the root systems of our lives where our thoughts and our desires and our ambitions are formed. So as we lean into chapter 5, the Apostle Paul continues to make clear his perplexity at how the Galatians were behaving. As a quick recap, in chapters 1 and 2, he made his appeal on religious grounds. In chapters 3 and 4, he makes his, his appeal on, on historical grounds, going back to the time of Abraham, which predates the giving of the law and the establishment of religion. And now here in chapter 5, he makes his appeal on moral grounds. Out of a genuine, loving concern, he'll say things like, who cut in on you from obeying the truth, he'll say. He confesses, his confusion with their behavior and then leaves them a challenge right at the very end of this, of this chapter. He says, let us not be conceited, provoking and envying each other. You see, Paul wants, us, wants to help them to live a flourishing life, a life found through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So let me invite you to follow along as, as we read chapter 5 together. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that 
If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value at all. Again, I declare that every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he's obligated to obey the whole law. Who are you trying to judge? Who are, you, who are you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ? You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the right we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they could go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. <coughs> but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. For those who are most familiar, this passage is anchored, anchored and highlighted and most known for the ending part, the fruit of the Spirit, right? Some of you, having grown up in Christian, Christian circles, when you were small, you attach songs to these things. I don't really know them. Anybody got a song they want to share? Okay. <laughs> Anybody got a fruit of the, Aaron, you got a fruit of the Spirit song. You're singing it. You might as well sing it louder. <laughs> On the internet, that's recorded as a no. Who's got a song they want to sing? This is the only one I know. You tell me whether this is right. Love, joy, peace, and patience. Kindness, goodness, faith. Um, that's it? Nobody else knows that. You got to be kidding. Who taught me that? <laughs> you know it? No, you made it up. Yeah, I made it up. <laughs> I made it up. You know, that's entirely possible. <laughs> that's entirely possible. All right. I am going to do my best to distract you from that song that you know that's down in your head that you don't want to share, and then we'll deal with that, that later. And now I have to process all the while, did I actually make that song up? I can sing the rest of it at the end if you want. All this to say that we should be reminded that the fruit is the end of the growth process. That's not all that's going on here. So let me say that again. The fruit is the end result of the growth process. Fruit just doesn't happen like that. 
Paul uses this analogy of fruit in part because of the way in which he first presented the gospel, the good news of God's love. He did so, if you go back to Acts chapter 14, by, by highlighting the creation care of our creator God. The Galatians understood this whole premise. A flourishing life doesn't just happen by starting it, starting one way and then cutting it off and putting it into another garden apart from proper loving care. And when we understand their, their context, then the end with which we're most familiar makes more sense because of how this premise was introduced to them at the beginning of chapter 5. Verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. The translation uh, says it this way. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Speaking of religious laws. Your life in Christ is purposed to be a flourishing life. As you recognize and honor Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are freed by him and you're freed for him. So stay with him. Stay with him. That's what's going to happen all through this. And a flourishing life is a life of freedom found in Jesus Christ. But notice first, that we are freed by the grace of God. You see that in verses 2 to 4. God's grace, that is his favor towards us, is not based on what we do. Even good religious customs, practices, and traditions, when they fail to point us to God and to deepen our dependence upon who God is, then we deny ourselves the opportunity to be renewed by his grace, which results in a lack of grace in relating to others. Secondly, we're free to wait. Our faith in Christ frees us from the concept that all our desires will be fulfilled on an earthly timeline. When we acknowledge Christ as our Savior, He sends the Holy Spirit to live in us. And part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to deepen our longing for those things that will be complete and whole when Jesus returns, when he has conquered evil, and when he has established his eternal kingdom for all of eternity. And sometimes the tension that you and I feel is the longing for those things that can only be established according, according to the fulfillment of God's power and promise. And therefore, we are free. We are free to wait with hopeful expectation. But notice thirdly that we are free to love. You see that in, great, in, in, uh, in verse 6? The greatest expression of our faith is how we, how we handle others, how we learn to relate to others with a sacrificial love that desires for them also to flourish. That's not easy. Author and pastor uh, Eugene Peterson says it this way. He says, love is not a word that describes my feelings in the way it's used here. It is not a technique by which I fulfill my needs. It is not an ideal, an abstract, or pure on which I meditate or discourse. It is acting in correspondence with or in response to God in relationship, in relation to persons. You know, we are increasingly living in an autonomous culture where everyone does what is right in their own eyes for their own well-being and can defend it as so. We are a society, I will say, that lacks love. For those of you who can remember a few weeks back, Paul in saying, is saying in verse 6, it's really not about your religious preference or your tradition, as he talks about circumcision or uncircumcision, or as we coined, whether you have jello salad or not have jello salad. One is not necessarily a better indication of your relationship with Jesus, Love, Christ-inspired, sacrificial love, is the needed antidote to allow for the flourishing of women and men, girls and boys, for our community and all around the world. So we are free by grace. 
We are free to wait. And we are free to love. I want you to notice, fourthly, we're free to serve. Paul, for the third or fourth time in this short letter, he expresses his concern and observation of the Galatians. They're not flourishing. They've neglected the impulse of God and the example of Jesus Christ and the, the work of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and they have, they're not serving others. They have misunderstood freedom. They think it means, I can do whatever I want. See, there's confusion in their lives because of the negative influence of others who are telling them that they've got to look after themselves first and they've got to do things this way. Instead, Paul says this, and these are important words. He says, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Paul's words are a reminder that the freedom that we receive from Christ is best is to be expressed in service towards others. You see, there's always going to be a difference between what you can do and what you should do. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because it's permissible doesn't make it beneficial. Just because it's socially or culturally acceptable doesn't make it wise. Just because it's legal doesn't make it acceptable or doable no matter what it is. I think you might agree we live in a, a system, a collective system of shifting standards wherever we go, whether you start with video game ratings or moving, movie ratings, whether it's smoking or drinking or gambling or the age of consent for sexual activity or gender identity or the decriminalization of drugs and the implementation of harm reduction strategies to our lack of standards around the beginning of life and our growing indifference to dealing with suffering and the end of life. It's a challenging time out there. There's a lot of options for the it. And let me be really clear, you're free to choose. You're absolutely free to choose. Just because, though, just because something is permissible doesn't, or something is acceptable or something is legal, doesn't make it morally or God-honoring. And one of the tests for this is, how is this fostering relationship with others? Or as, as Paul would say, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. And we, almost like you could feel that in our community, can't you? In other words, you are free to choose, Paul would say, but you are not free to choose your consequences. And therefore, notice, fifthly, we are also, our freedom, this doesn't get spoken about very much, we are free to resist. We are free to resist, in particular, sin, the grip of sin. Freedom is Christ, in Christ is not I can do whatever I want. Freedom in Christ says I get to choose to honor God by the choices I make for the benefit of others. That's where that starts. And you say, well, that's not fair. I should be able to do what I want. That's my life. You're right. The life you have been given, though none of it by your design and timing is a whole other conversation, it is yours to live. Paul understood this, and now he does offer them a choice. And it's a choice that you can always come back to, no matter where you find yourself on this road. And you can come back to it again and again. That in Christ, you are free. You are free <clears throat> to resist the twisting spiral of sinful desire by staying aware of the, uh, and responsive to the work of the Spirit of God in your life. You know, there are two lies about sinful desire that are always present. One is, a little indulgence is no big deal. And the second is, try it. You'll be glad you did. And the first one, Paul reminds us that sinful desire is contrary and oppositional to the work of the Spirit. The lie that you come to believe, that you and I come to believe, is that you're sticking close to godliness. It's okay. You can kind of see it there. But make no mistake, sin and sinful desire do not walk the road, same road as the freedom that comes from pursuing righteousness. The second is, 
that giving in to sin sinful desire is, is satisfying. But that's a lie. That lie, the lie is that that desire isn't satisfied. Sinful desire calls you back for more. It takes from you, it takes you further away from God's blessing for you, and it just takes from you. However, to be led by the Spirit, Paul says, is to be free from that. You can resist that. And just to make sure they get it, Paul starts a list. He starts a list knowing that his audience is diverse, just like we are today. And that sinful desire seeks to entrap us all at various areas of our vulnerability. And that might change over the course of time or season of our life or the things that are going on. But listen to this list. Adultery and sexual immorality, sexual relations outside of your marriage relationship. Impurity, which is sexual behavior that is not in keeping with God's standard of holiness. Debauchery, which is a confusing word to even say, but it, it really reflects the shameless boasting or pride with regard to immoral living. Idolatry, which is greed, a spirit of greed and a misplaced centering of our lives and our energy and our finances. Often, often a way to discern this is asking the question, what am I living for? What am I pursuing? That reveals our idols. We read this word witchcraft, and while it can't speak to the idea of sorcery and evil, it is more likely referencing the use of mind-altering substances or, substances, or what we would typically call drugs. And some of, those, some of these don't need as much explanation. They're kind of self-evident uh, self to you, but they're still difficult to hear. And they're even more disturbing when we feel those desires rise up within us. Hatred, discord, which is being argumentative, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, which is intentionally causing division among people, factions. It's the idea of taking, forming a different version of the truth and then promoting it within a group and enticing others to join in against others or envy, or drunkenness, orgies, and revelries, which are riotous pr processions characterized by reckless indulgence. But don't miss this. Don't miss how this ends. At the end of that verse, check it out. It says, he has these words, and the like. And the like. You see, it's not an exhaustive list of what characterizes sinful nature so that you can kind of define yourself out of it. There's, it's an endless list. It can keep being added on to, and maybe there are characterizations that you would want to add on to it. And notice also that the sinful, these sinful, uh, these acts, or these things are, de are designated as acts. They are visible for all to see. That the lie, you know, one of the deceptions of, of our sinful desire is that we, they are hidden. But these desires, once they fed, you know, they become evident to others, often before it becomes evident to us. And that's part of the deception and the confusion <clears throat> that sinful desire brings. Paul also warns that those actions, if they are evident on an ongoing basis by which a person can be characterized, then the authenticity of their claims to salvation in Christ can be rightly questioned. You're ready for good news. We need good news. A flourishing life is a life of freedom found in Jesus because we are free to flourish by the work of the Holy Spirit. We see that at the end of the chapter, verses 22 to 26. With a return to the choice that he previously gave when he presented this choice to walk by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, Paul, in simplicity, lays out the benefits of learning to live freely in Christ. And as you listen again to this list, I could sing my song if you'd like. Ask yourself if you wouldn't benefit from receiving more of these qualities from others. Ask yourself 
if our community and the world around us wouldn't benefit from more evidence of these qualities. Ask yourself if you wouldn't feel better with the evidence of these qualities informing your life and your choices. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And in contrast to the previous list, where it continued on and on, the difference with this list is there is no limit to how much you can use or receive of these qualities, these characteristics, this fruit of the Spirit. There is a freedom to flourish as we incline our lives to allowing the Spirit of God to work in us and through us towards others. The question for us is, how? So let me offer you three ways uh, to flourish that I, that I think comes from this passage. Number one is, learn to stand. Learn to stand. In verse one, Paul introduces this whole section, we're going back to that again, with what is often considered as the core message of the whole letter. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free, stand firm then. We often focus on this end piece, the flourishing and the fruitfulness end. We want that. But the fruit doesn't just appear. The tree's got to stand. And this is not like taking a stand against opposition or standing against and showing strength. It's a different kind of connotation here. This is a standing with stillness in the presence of God. This kind of standing is, is being with, with the Israelites as they are escaping hundreds of years of slavery in the book of Exodus in chapter 14, 13 and 14. They think they got to take a military stand, and so they get dressed up in battle gear. You read that in, in Exodus 13 and verse 18. And then... Then says, God, God says, I know they're not ready. They think they're ready. But that God says, I know they're not ready. And he takes them to the Red Sea. And now they're pinned up against the Red Sea. And they see that the Egyptians are coming after them. They're not going to make a military stand. <clears throat> they won't stand against that. They're, they're too filled with fear. They can't take a stand because... They've only ever known, they've grown up in this, this, this being enslaved by evil. Rather, the instruction as they're led by the Spirit of God is to stand in the presence of God. Listen to these words from, Mo from Moses in, uh, in Exodus chapter 14. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. The stillness of standing in the presence of God. It's a humble posture of worship that anticipates and recognizes that God is working even when I can't see him. And it allows him to develop our lives by his spirit, according to the character of Jesus. The second thing that I think we can take from this is crucify our sinful desires. As we still ourselves in the presence of God, undoubtedly he reveals areas of our life that need to change. Those sinful desires can only be dealt with through confession that in a confession to God that we need Jesus to deal with them. We are always tempted to hang on with them, hang on to them. And this is the picture of the contemplative and repentant sinner praying in the temple. And you can look it up in Mark chapter 11 and verse 25. In view of God's holiness, he confesses sin and he is strengthened by God. He receives then the forgiveness of God all the more. And that strength, we're reminded by Paul, is not one of our own will or our determination. That strength comes 
from a yieldedness, an identification with the crucifixion of Jesus. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So when you sense those desires welling up and grabbing hold of you, point them to Jesus. Those sinful desires have no authority over you because of Jesus. Jesus has taken their power. And when you give your life to Jesus, when you acknowledge Christ as your Savior, when you identify with him in his death, then you also identify with him in his victory over death and over sin. You crucify the power of sin. And he gives you his Holy Spirit so that you can understand these other virtues that he desires to have evident in your life. Thirdly, follow the Spirit. There is, there is tremendous freedom in Christ. Therefore, Paul encourages, implores, and yearns for us. He says, look at, if you look through this, walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit always is going to be moving in the circumstances of our lives and leading us through. And too often we make our plans, and then we try to look around and see, is, is God going to join us in our plans? We take on too much. You know, we overspend, we overindulge, we fail to rest. What would happen if you and I, instead, instead of starting each day with, I have to do this or this or this, which essentially is populating our own agenda, what if it, instead we start each day with, I get to follow the Spirit of God today? I promise you, if you build that in daily, I get to follow the Spirit of God today. I promise you, as you do, the evidence of the Spirit of God will begin to appear through your circumstances and will influence the direction of your life through your own life and from others towards you. I get to follow the Spirit of God today. You know, speaking of fruit, we can, we can get fruit all year round at the grocery store. Right? I grew up in the city. That's all I ever knew. Fruit came in the grocery store. We had a store called Top Banana. It was right across the street from where we live, in the mall right where we live. We walk into the store, just like today, fruits piled high all over the place. Shined up nice, a little water spray on it, bright lights pointing down the right direction, bruises to the back, right? They all look really good every single day, every single week, all year round. I had no idea that oranges and bananas and apples and things like that, they don't grow all year round. Did you know that? Did you know that avocados don't even grow here? I'm telling you, there's, it's crazy. We are, we are indoctrinated. We, are, we come to believe that we can just have whatever we want, whenever we want. But fruit, fruit. And so the grocery store compels us to believe this lie that fruit just appears over and over and over again. And so we can quickly forget the process of seeing fruit and enjoying fruit doesn't just happen. It takes time. It takes the right environment. It takes the proper care of a fruit tree to flourish. The average fruit tree takes between four and seven years to bring a yield. It takes years of stillness, of standing, allowing roots and soil to be cultivated in the right environment being nourished before fruit will bear. And then when it does, it only does for a season because it takes time, stillness, and standing to be able to bring another yield. That's the invitation of Jesus that we sung about from John chapter 15, to stay connected to him, remain in him, abide in him, so that we may bear fruit, that we may demonstrate his character through our lives. We can't make fruit pop through those buds. The extent to which we allow our desires to be informed by the truth of God, the life of Jesus, and the influence of the Spirit of God will be the extent to which our life in Christ will be a flourishing life. It's time to grow. Let me invite you to do that. Let's pray together. So, Father, as we uh, 
consider your invitation, your desire for us to live free. We acknowledge first uh, our gratitude to your grace and your mercy towards us. Thank you for the gift of life that you've given to us through Jesus Christ. Thank you that it is only in him where we are truly free. And so, Father, we also then pray in confession for harboring sinful desire, for entertaining it, for allowing it to fester. And we ask, God, that you would indeed, in in confession, you would forgive us of our sin and, and renew us in the righteousness that comes from Christ. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to be more responsive to the work of your Spirit within us for those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior. May we know, be more responsive to how he is stepping forward. May we follow him, walk with him in it through the circumstances that we are in. May we be attentive to the demonstration of the fruit of the Spirit around us and then give return thanks to you. And in all these things, Father, may we also then be patient. Teach us stillness through which your character is developed in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to make uh, <clears throat> just a, a little transition here, and uh, and before we we take communion, I want to invite you uh, into that. And um, if you have uh, if you have already got one of these little cups, then um, if you haven't, then you can, you can run out and get one in the foyer, or there's some up here. And if you're here this morning and you know what it means to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, then I invite you to participate. If you recognize the sacrifice of Christ on your behalf, <clears throat> that he died on the cross to take our sin, as we talked about, that he was buried, and after three days he rose again, and he showed himself to the disciples to say, I'm, I'm alive, and that he's ascended to the heavens, and now he waits to return, to establish those things for which our, lo- our hearts long for, not only for ourselves, but for the world in which we live. Is that, if that's your confession, that's your understanding, then I invite you to participate with us in a moment. We are going to uh, just take that wafer, which is the, the first little foil slip on the top, and then we'll drink together, which is the second bigger tab on the bottom. But as we do, let me encourage you to consider this. This, this little wafer is the bread. It's symbolizes the body of Christ broken for us, absorbing the punishment for our sin, taking our wounds, the woundedness that our selfish desires bring, and he suffers for them. And so as we take this wafer, It's a good act today in light of what we have learned to crucify our selfish desires with him. And then in a moment, we will drink together this this juice and this juice is the blood of Christ shed for us. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so we are renewed by the sacrifice of the perfect Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord, on our behalf. And in so doing, then we acknowledge His supremacy in our life, His priority of our life, being the center of our life, that we might be all the more responsive to Him. And so would you take a moment and just reflect on that? Aaron's going to play I'll pray and then we'll take, we'll eat and we'll drink together.
moments of stillness are hard for us. But in these moments of stillness, we give you thanks. We are incredibly grateful. Our words can't even express the difference that it makes to know that Christ is crucified for our sin. Thank you, God, for the body of Christ. And for his blood shed on the cross, we thank you, Father, for the significance and the intensity of his suffering through which we have life. For the forgiveness of sin, this restoration of relationship with you to be called the child of God because of that sacrifice. We give you thanks. So we join together with brothers and sisters across our city and around the world acknowledging Christ, the King, the Savior of all. And we pray in the name of our Redeemer and our Savior. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. <clears throat> and when he had given thanks, which is do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat, this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This act of communion is a way of stilling ourselves before the Lord and inviting him all the more to lead us forward by his spirit. Amen. And invite the music team to come and lead us in this last song. And as they do, here's my little song. Love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit. It does sound like I made it up, didn't it? Yeah. 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 There you go. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to stand and we're going to sing one more time. The Lord is my salvation. Would you um, proclaim this together with us today?
Amen. Hey, let me just remind you, tonight, 630, uh, Temple Baptist, joining with the brothers and sisters from across the city. would love to see you there. And uh, as you go, uh, let me send you this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God has appointed you to live in a flourishing life. May you go in his peace. And all God's people said, amen. God be with you. Have a great week.